to Voices of Experience, the podcast of the National Speakers Association. I'm your host, technology strategist and futurist, Crystal Washington. In today's show, the last of 2019 and this decade, we'll explore effective content and social media marketing for professional speakers. The Shep Hyken is in the VOE studio to share the one thing that you're likely not doing that will pay off tremendously if you commit to doing it now. Then Michelle McCullough will share how you can take a social media audit to figure out where you should and shouldn't be. Lastly, Andrea Vall will tell us what you need to know about getting results using Facebook ads. Let's get started. So I am beyond excited for our next guest on Voices of Experience. We have Mr. Shep Hyken. Now, Shep has over 250 articles that he's written for Forbes. Additionally, he has created over 1,000 blog posts. Now, another interesting set of numbers for you is his very first speaking engagement was when he was 12 years old, and it was for 20 screaming six-year-olds. And somehow that didn't turn him off to the business. So we're really excited to have Shep with us here today. Thank yeah, you, Shep. And by the way, I got paid. Are we allowed to talk money? I got paid $15. 15 And they gave me a dollar tip on the way out the door. I said, I I am set. I mean, do you know, and back then, $16 in today's money is like $4,912. Is that how that works? <laughs> is that how because works? I promise you. Am I that you, old? No. <laughs> there's, there's some speakers right now that that $16 might be looking pretty good to you. Yeah. So that's okay. <laughs> We're doing good with that. Well, first off, I just want to thank you again because you are an expert when it comes to content marketing specifically for speakers. And you've really leveraged that in your business. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to help us with this. But here's a question. As a professional speaker, why should you even worry about content marketing? Why, why would it help your speaking business? Well, and first, Crystal, thanks for having me. And, and, and expert is a big word. It works for me. Okay. And so we found that content marketing is actually the best positioning for us. But the key is not just writing an article and hoping it works. Mm-hmm. It's writing an article this week and next week and the next week and the consistency. And then taking that article and taking uh, a sentence out of it and using it as a tweet and cr- taking a quote and creating a meme and putting it on Instagram and Pinterest. So the idea idea is, and a lot of people start with a video, which mm-hmm. by the way, we turn the article into a video. Oh. But if you started with a video first, you can take, if you just like to speak extemporaneously, <laughs> then turn that into an article. And from the article, then you start, do you see what happens is you it use does. one piece of content and the idea is you leverage that and it takes practice. It took a long time for my brain to be able to uh, write an article, a minimum of one a week for my own uh, you know, personal blog. And then mm-hmm. I actually write at least two others a week, one for Forbes, been writing for Forbes for now about uh, not quite five years okay. every week. It's my contract. And you know what? Great positioning. And the reason it's working so well is because the internet and social media has allowed us to expand our reach with this content. And I used to, and I still believe when times are tough and the, and the phone's not ringing, mm-hmm. I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to start calling. So it's smiling and dialing on the way out, which is how I started my career. Okay. I, I got my first 100 potential prospects. I picked up the phone, started smiling and dialing. That was a long time ago. And And then when social started working, uh, I found myself having a choice. I didn't have the time to do all the writing because I was still spending two and three hours a day when I was in the office on the phone talking to clients picking up the phone and, and those outbound calls. Now, mm-hmm. there is a point in time in your career when you hit a certain success level that you're not the one who's supposed to be making those calls. Okay. And that was happening, knock on wood, which I'm not going to knock because the microphone will go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, um, I said, what's my choice? If I write an article, if I spend a couple hours a day writing an article, doing a video, getting that ready, same amount of time I'd spend on the phone talking to clients, I could put that out there and maybe... Uh, well, our newsletter, you know, we always have been hovering around 18 to 20, 22,000 or so, maybe a little bit less. And we have a nice open rate. I'm now going to be seen by several thousand people as opposed mm. to picking up the phone. And chances are out of 100 calls, I'm going to connect with maybe 10 to 12 people. Mm-hmm. And of those people, maybe a few of them are going to be interested in talking to me and maybe a small percentage interested in booking me. Which, by the way, as I mentioned, if times get tough, if we hit a recession and the phone's mm-hmm. not ringing, right. I'm picking up the phone and I'm going to do that in addition to continuing the content marketing. But as of today, that content marketing and for the last, I don't know, five or six years, Mm -hmm. has done an amazing job positioning me as the expert that I am. 
Well, I would think that gives you a competitive advantage, even in the minds of your followers, because if these people are seeing your content and then contacting you, it gives you a little bit of leverage in that conversation versus you trying to call them. Right. That's the whole idea. When somebody calls you, they will take the time to learn about you. Mm -hmm. If you call them and say, hey, I I hope I didn't interrupt you. Is now a good time for me to tell you all about what I can do at your meeting? (laughs) (laughs) And I'm being facetious, but you understand that it's an interruption to them, and we're fine being interrupted by clients. We love that when that happens. Right. It's never actually an interruption. It's a joy. But um, I think if there's a couple of ideas that I want to share, it's that, you know, you start small. Just write the blog. And from the mm-hmm. blog, pull out a quote. That becomes a tweet. Realize that however many followers you have, about 1% will actually see that tweet. Mm-hmm. So modify it a little bit and do it two or three times throughout the week. And if you write a good article, you should be able to get at least a half a dozen little nuggets out of there. Okay. Create a meme. Put that meme on Instagram, which I didn't understand what the word meme was. It's just a clever little, I don't know, background with one of your your sayings on it. Mm -hmm. Pinterest. We get over a million views a year on my Pinterest site. Really? I don't know. Pinterest. I have no idea. That's amazing. I know. So I'll tell you what we do. Every week I feature a book that I've read or that I want to read. And and it's like, here's a little book and a picture of it. I also, uh, once again, the memes. So we we probably post two or three times. Okay. By the way, we post consistently. That book is every Monday. That's what happens every Monday. So you have a content... Schedule. schedule. Oh, yeah. That's that you the, follow. Like, right, it right. sounds like you ha- kind of have your Bible sure. of, of marketing sure. here. And I will g- give you that schedule in 30 seconds. So okay. on Monday, uh, I send, I write an article that anybody can write. I read a tremendous amount, 10 or 15 articles a day. I take my five favorite. I do a one or two sentence. Here's why I like this and a link to it. So it's my top five articles of the week. Okay. Tuesday is my podcast. Wednesday is my newsletter that goes out, which also is posted as a blog. Mm-hmm. Thursday is the video based on one of the past newsletters that I've written. Okay. Friday, we have a guest post, and I set it up with my opinion on what I think of, of, and by the way, it's all tied to my area of customer service and experience. Okay. That's what I talk about. Saturday, we do some general posting promoting what we've done all week long. Sunday is when my Forbes article comes out every Sunday morning. Okay. And we're back to And Monday. you get to breathe. Yeah, yeah. And you get to breathe then. So from what you're saying here, it sounds to me like even speakers that are just now getting started, right, and they're saying, oh, I don't know if I have time. I'm wondering if they can repurpose some of the things they've take already the created. Time. Yeah, take it. Just one article a week, 400, mm-hmm. 500 words, should take less than an hour to do. And get in practice, and you'll start to see opportunities. Your mind starts to work. That would make a great article. Mm. And from that, you can uh, create derivative product or okay. derivative content. So from your experience, where do you think are the three most important places to post content for the average professional speaker? Number one on your website Okay. And again, I'm going to assume everybody's going to stay in their lane and write about what they do, mm-hmm. which optimizes your website. Number two is your website. Number three is your website. <laughs> no, and number two, I would say, you know, take that. I would think Twitter for business, okay. and then also take that article posted on LinkedIn. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So LinkedIn, the business social network. Yep. Twitter, the one that appeals a lot to news media yeah. and general people. And business is using Twitter. Mm. Uh, we're finding more and more, you know, Facebook and all that. It's not as strong for business, but business and Twitter still go together pretty well. Okay. By the way, repurposing that article, it can go on LinkedIn, it can go on other blog sites. We get picked up by a dozen syndicated places every week. Okay. So it's, you know, I write the article and it, it gets repur- repurposed, repurposed, that's it, reproduced and repurposed. I love it. <laughs> so is there a specific tactic, this is my last question for you if you have time, but is there a specific tactic that is working for you now that you wish you had been doing five plus years ago? Wow. Um, is there something specific? I think video is so strong, but I mm. have almost 600 videos on on my YouTube channel. And again, that's an optimized opportunity. I think just getting better and better at SEO, understanding how it works, and that mm-hmm. search engine optimization. So when you type in my topic, mm-hmm. I show up as a name at the top of the page or one of the top people in the page. So you mean that when you're creating these YouTube videos, then the titles you're using aren't just your name and something jazzy. You're no. actually using yep. keywords, keywords that you want to be found for. Mm-hmm. And yep. with over 600 videos, that's a lot of different keywords so you can of, get well, in I'm there. I'm not using 600 different keywords, right, but right. I'm using you know the terms. I'm a customer service experience guy. So mm-hmm. what do you think is going to show up in a lot of the titles? You know, great customer service story at a grocery store at a mm. you know whatever I'm just making that up but you can if you want to find out go to shep.tv and just see what we're doing there and and know that almost all of those uh, video uh, customer service tips were articles that I've already written that are also on my blog wow that's yeah. amazing Shep thank you so much thank for you, your Crystal. time great today. to be here thank you 
Now that we know what kind of content we should be producing, let's discover which social media platforms might be able to help us disseminate the information. So today I'm excited that we have Michelle McCullough, who is a keynote speaker with over 300,000 followers on Twitter, and she has a podcast with over a million downloads. Michelle, thank you for joining us. I am thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. How do you get over a million downloads? <laughs> well, um, hard work and Twitter also helps sending be able, being able to send things out to the audience. Um, but I think the trick time and time again is promoting good content and putting things out people will listen to. Well, that's solid advice. And I know today we're kind of talking about having a social media audit. So anyone that's listening, these professional speakers, what should they be paying attention to? So what are the top two social networks that professional speakers should use to attract business and gain referrals? Well, at first, I would say it depends on the kind of business that you're in, and different industries work differently. Twitter works for me, but it probably wouldn't work for all speakers. And so I usually typically recommend LinkedIn for the professional environment, and then I recommend the best content outlet. So whether that's YouTube for regular videos, or Twitter or Instagram with Instagram TV, a second outlet really should be focused on how can you reach your audience with the content so that you can build your expertise. So to make sure that I'm understanding, you're saying LinkedIn, that's where you set up that professional profile because we're professional speakers, right? right? That's where our clients are. But then we also need to focus on pushing out good quality content. And it sounds like you're saying there's some flexibility on which network we use. How would you choose which one of those networks you should use for pushing your content? Well, I would start by telling everyone that you should put... Um, your profile out in all like the top six. So Twitter, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, um, maybe even Snapchat if you are going in that direction. But of course, that would be a completely separate audience and play with them for a little bit. But give yourself an opportunity for a couple of weeks to see how your audience reacts to the type of content you put out. Do they react better with short, tiny statements and quick videos on Twitter? Or do they react better with longer form content through like a YouTube or even like a Facebook Live? And is your audience really interacting there? Some of us choose our favorite outlets based off of where we like to play as consumers instead of thinking about where does our audience like to play as meeting planners, event organizers, um, corporations, and the people who are actually going to book you. So think about that and play with it for a little bit. And then I highly recommend only choosing one or two outlets and going deep. Um, Social media works best, especially if you're an expert and you're going to be doing it mostly yourself, even with some admin help or an assistant help. Um, If you're building a sense of community by being active and involved. It's really hard for speakers, even high-level ones, to be in multiple places and to really build a community. Twitter worked for us because it was just a place where we could go deep and connect with our audience. And so because of that, that worked. But you have to be willing to play the game and interact, not just produce content. So I love the fact that you're basically saying that it's not an exact science, but it also sounds like they can get some direction by just looking at the demographics of their target audience. Absolutely. Okay. And you can easily find demographic information for each of the social media outlets online and decide, okay, is this the right place for my audience? And if so, yes, I want to be there. So if I'm trying to reach uh, C-suite executives over the age of 50, then Snapchat probably isn't where I should be. mm -mm. It's basically what we're saying here. Right. But if you have a millennial brand and you're looking for businesses or even colleges and universities, then of course you'd pick pick Snapchat. Understood, understood. So let me ask you this. I know that you said that LinkedIn is the one that seems like across the board everyone should pay attention to. Is there one or two things that anyone listening should look at LinkedIn right now and tweak or revisit? I think if you haven't updated your profile in the last six months, you definitely need to do that. But I also think that where you need a secondary outlet for content, don't discredit LinkedIn for content because you can post articles, you can post um, information and content in regular posts, you can be really active in groups. And so I think it's just a matter of going in, doing the work, playing with some things and sharing your content in a way that you can really engage and interact, but also so that you're putting the right information out there for the right people to see it. So you're not just putting out something just for the image. It's actually things that are usable to the audience. Correct. So you kind of have to get in their head, it sounds like. For sure. And for a lot of us, the information that we would put out and share with an audience is different than the information we would share with a meeting planner. So you also have to be careful with that as well and consider both of those audiences and balance the kind of content you put out so you're reaching both types of people. Oh. So here's a question for you. 
Is there something that you're seeing um, that speakers are doing that we shouldn't be doing or something that you're seeing a lot of speakers um, aren't doing that they should be? I don't know if I said that right, but you get it. Either way it goes, what's our no-no that we need to do the other way? I would say, number one, in the digital automated day and age, it's really easy to create a lot of content and memes and put graphics out there and consider your social media done. But for me, I think one of the biggest mistakes I see speakers make and experts in general is that they're putting out content, but they're not spending the time to interact with the audience. And so they're really just pushing, but not having the two-way communication that really builds a sense of connection. And meeting planners see that. I'll see people who will say, hey, you were the only one who responded to my comment. And so they'll interact and comment with speakers' content, but then the speakers aren't going back and interacting back with them so they can tell that it's purely robotic. So I would say that would be number one. And the second is um, just really getting clear about what kind of message and expertise you're trying to put out there and making sure your images and graphics are branded. So making sure that everything from the memes that you put out to longer form content to videos are all part of a bigger picture that says this is a cohesive approach, that when they go from your LinkedIn and they get to your website that those match, and that the branding seems legitimate rather than pulling it in from a bunch of different places just because it looks pretty. Now when you say branding, do you need, do you mean that we need to slap our logo on every single thing? Does it need to be similar colors? What does branding mean in this instance? I don't necessarily think your logo has to be on every single kind of graphic or video that you do, but I do think they should look similar. Corporations wouldn't just pull random comp- content from different places and use every single Canva uh, template there is. They would make sure that even if it wasn't didn't have their logo, that it would look like a cohesive part of their brand. And so I have paid graphic designers to do social media templates for me that aren't necessarily my logo all the time but are branded in that way and I think that as people look at your social media following you know Instagram's a great example if they go to your pages and they see all of your different pictures do they look cohesive or do they look like a mixed message think of all of your social outlets like a magazine how would you help them look consistent from page to page and from from issue to issue so that it looks and feels like you and that your branding exists exists above and beyond just that individual post. So when you talk about this consistency, and I'm guessing we're talking about consistency not only in look, but also in response and posting, as you've talked about, can you share maybe two or three power tools that can help you with this via social media? Sure. Um, I think that social media schedulers are great, but I think that in the good, better, best category. If you can avoid using a third-party scheduler, your posts will do better and the algorithm will be happier. For example, you should never, ever use a scheduler on Facebook posts because that'll kill it. But you can go into a, a Facebook and schedule within Facebook, which is okay, but again, live posting is, is a lot better. Um, but in terms of tools, I definitely recommend that if you're not currently investing in graphic tools that you do that. So like I said, the branded templates, um, using even if you have to do it yourself through a Canva, which I don't, which I love still. Canva is a great resource and um, relatively inexpensive. I would recommend that as well. And then I would also recommend investing in some type of statistics or um, dashboard that will help you see what's working, what's not working. And a lot of the social media outlets will do that for you, but at least Google Analytics on your website and um, some of the others, there's a lot of different options. I don't necessarily want to name specifics, but if you just look for social media insights on Google and try some free trials, you'll find the one that's right for you. This is perfect. Well, I want to thank you again, Michelle, for giving of your time and helping all of us get more social media savvy. So thank you, and we look forward to having you again in the future. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Time to get specific. Let's take a deeper dive into Facebook, specifically Facebook ads. In the studio today with Voices of Experience, we have Andrea Vall. Now, Andrea has helped entrepreneurs sell over $1 million worth of products in the last two years. How, you ask? Via Facebook ads. So who better to talk to us today about Facebook ads for speakers? Thanks for joining us, Andrea. So great to be here. So first question is, why should professional speakers care about using Facebook ads? Facebook ads are perfect for speakers because they can help boost their brand, but also grow their email list and get more clients and sales. Get more sales. I think everyone is listening now. That's that's the magic <laughs> word, right? Because it's, it's a business. You mentioned boosting, but not in this way, but it brings me to the next question. What is a boosted post and when is it helpful or not helpful to use them? Because some of us just boost a post and think, I'm doing Facebook ads. This is great. 
Unfortunately, boosted posts are one of the easiest ways to advertise on Facebook, but mm-hmm. not one of the most effective ways because mm-hmm. they're very limited mm-hmm. in how they're optimized. A better way to advertise is to use the Facebook Ads Manager mm-hmm. and create your ad around your specific objectives, such mm-hmm. as conversions or lead generation or video views. Okay. But okay. boosted posts can still be a good thing when you're just Uh, amplifying something that you already have posted on your wall, but you have to use specific targeting to make it better. So not just boosting randomly, it still requires a little bit of strategy, it sounds like. Exactly. Okay. Speaking of strategy, let's talk about one of my favorite types of online ads, which is retargeting ads. What are they and how can they help speakers specifically? Retargeting ads are perfect actually for the boosted post as well as other types of blog post engagement Mm -hmm. that you're trying to do. And what you can advertise around is people who have watched your videos, people Mm -hmm. who have been to your website, Mm -hmm. and people who have signed up for your email newsletter. Okay. And the great thing with retargeting ads is that you're spending less money Mm -hmm. to reach people who are already familiar with you. Ooh. And now you're saving a bunch of money, but your audience thinks you're everywhere. Right. And so they think you're extremely popular. They're like, I keep hearing about this speaker, but I don't remember where. And you're tapping them. So I see a lot of value there. So let's talk about custom audiences. Should speakers use this option within Facebook ads? Anyone who's ever gone inside of Facebook ads, maybe they're not familiar, they might have seen the custom audiences tab and not really understood it. Right. A lot of people get confused with custom audiences. Mm -hmm. And that is where you build your retargeting audiences. Mm -hmm. And you can also do things that are a little more complex where you're advertising to people who have been to your website but haven't purchased your product yet, Mm. for example. So you can do something a little more advanced with building a special audience. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way to make sure that you're always consistent with your marketing and you know your advertising to the people you absolutely want to be in front of. Okay, okay. So for speakers listening right now who are sold on using Facebook ads, which I would imagine is probably a good portion because who doesn't want to touch those people who are already aware but who haven't bought yet? What are their next three steps? Your next step and your very first step that needs to be taken is to put the Facebook pixel on your website. Okay. That needs to happen immediately because mm-hmm. that's what starts gathering that audience so that you can use the retargeting. And it's a simple process that just has to happen one time. Mm-hmm. The next step is to then build those custom audiences and take a look at some of the things that you can be doing to boost your brand, such as creating some videos and then boosting those to those that retargeted audience mm-hmm. and have a strategy for getting people on your email list. Okay. Okay. For anyone who doesn't know where your Facebook pixel is, can I just make a suggestion? And that would be go on Google or go to YouTube and type in where to find my Facebook pixel or find Facebook pixel. And it will show you where you can go to copy and it'll tell you where you need to paste it. And I have a great blog post that tells you the exact steps on how to get that pixel installed Mm -hmm. for different types of websites. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I think that's about all of our questions for today. Is there anything else that you think speakers should be aware of when it comes to leveraging Facebook ads to grow their businesses? Yeah, one of the great things that's available in Facebook ads is you can target people by job title. So you can Mm. go out and target people like meeting planners Mm -hmm. or executive directors, whoever might have that job title that's perfect for you to get in front of. And you can also target the fans of other Facebook pages. Ooh, sneaky, sneaky. So if you know that your audience is a perfect fit for you and they're a fan of a, another Facebook page, mm-hmm. you can target the fans of those, those pages. So get creative, start doing a little research in the targeting area. Thank you for tuning in to Voices of Experience, the podcast of the National Speakers Association. Catch us on your favorite podcast app, YouTube, and NSA's social media profiles. Have a wonderful new year, and I look forward to spending time with you in 2020. Be sure to tune in, as next week we're going to look at the industry trends you need to know for 2020.